Hi, I'm making this short video to sum up what we've learned so far in the digital art unit and to try to help you keep learning. There are plenty of opportunities and resources for you to continue, even though there's been a lot of disruption and these are very difficult times. Uh, the resources that we have include the books that were assigned for you to read about digital art, Christiane Paul's book named Digital Art, and Tenprint, Char String 205.5 plus Rand 1, go to 10. There's also the assignments that we have, and I will respond to the short essays. And I've also asked you, of course, uh, in an assignment to submit a one-line piece of software art, a basic program for the Commodore 64. During the normal course of a semester, we would have classroom meetings in which we would also further our education. We can't do that for the rest of this semester, but there are other ways to learn, and I encourage you to uh, pursue those and to keep uh, uh, making progress with your education as best as possible uh, while all of these other things are going on in the world. I want to talk about uh, several of the important things that we did in this digital art unit. The first of which was to offer our own individual definitions of art. One of the things that I did was to show that there are many different ways to think about art and to define art. And Sean Hall, in this book, offers eight of them in answer to the question, um, is this art, Marcel Duchamp's fountain, he gives, three, he gives these eight possibilities for how one could define art. All things people are generally disposed to call art. All things connoisseurs of art call art. All the things I call art. All the things displayed in art galleries. All the things that are called art by artists. All the things that common sense tells us are art. All the things that have the intrinsic properties of art. And all things that cause an artistic reaction in the viewer. Now, even this is not exhaustive. And it's based on artworks being things rather than art being a process. So there's much more to say about art. My hope is that whatever definition you started out with, you understand that there can be other definitions of art, and you understand why people think of art in different ways. Specifically, some of the things that we've discussed are that art is not always expressive. Some people might choose to express their own emotions or their own personal experiences, but some people might be exploring other aspects of the world, of perception, of cognition. Along those lines, art is not always visual or even perceptual, mainly. Art could be for the eye, but some types of art are for the mind. And we saw this with the example of a, a tool to deceive and slaughter, where its connection to eBay and its auctioning itself was the main point of the artwork. And how it happened to look uh, was not uh, very important. It wasn't that it provoked an aesthetic response when you looked at it visually, but it made us think about value. Uh, there's also the case that not all art is intentional. In some cases, it is done by chance and people have pursued uh, chance methods. Those people include the surrealists. Those people include um, people who are wishing to uh, get away from their own ego and their selves and produce chance works. We also discussed that uh, randomness, although it's associated with chance, can also refer to random access. Random can be the opposite of sequential not just the opposite of deterministic. 
Now, when it is the case that art is visual, and in the case of digital art, we might think of artworks that are visualizations particularly, it's not always the case that those visualizations are data visualizations. And we sometimes think of visualizations as exclusively telling us things about data or even big data. But there are other types of visualizations. And we've looked at visualizations of process, visualizations of algorithm that have been, for instance, Every Icon by John F. Simon Jr. and his other piece, Color Panel Version 1. Now, if we didn't know the difference between a process visualization and a data visualization, we wouldn't be able to talk about TinPrint, for instance, the computer program, that piece of software art, as being a visualization, because it is a visualization of process. It's showing us what happens when you pick a random character, one of two characters, a left or right leaning line, at each point, and when you draw it across the screen in the way that writing is done in the English language and also uh, Norwegian dialect writing systems. It's giving us a visualization not of data, but of process. Why would it be important to know that you can both have visualizations of data and visualizations of process? Well, interestingly enough, the Washington Post has just published an article using process visualization to try to educate readers about the spread of contagious disease. And it uses a process simulation to show how social distancing is the most effective way to prevent the spread of disease, that it can be even more effective than a forced quarantine. This specific work of journalism wouldn't have come about if the journalists and editors at the Washington Post thought that all visualization had to be data visualization. They knew that it was possible both to visualize data and to visualize processes. And because of that, they were able to create this article and this resource to provide more information to the public about the current pandemic. Now, we're not studying art because we expect all artworks to be of direct use and to do things like address current global health crises. But the things that we learn about art are relevant to other parts of digital culture, including journalism and including specifically the way that journalists communicate to the public about science. So I hope you don't think that what we have been discussing and what we've been learning about is completely sealed and is hermetically only applying to things that go on in galleries and museums. Um, we've also talked about how digital art doesn't always do things that uh, look a bit like art or look a lot like art 10 or 20 years later. Sometimes we may see pioneering types of works, such as the project 1 to 10 that produce these statuettes, that later are available in the form of 3D photo booths. It doesn't mean that those artworks are bad. It means that they're pioneering and they're relevant to a certain time and a certain context. I hope you can see that digital art serves to explore what art is, and it also serves to explore what the digital is. The digital, as I see it, is not simply discrete representation or numerical representation. It is the computational. And the way that computers are able to, with tremendous rapidity, manipulate symbols and manipulate digital media is something that digital art engages with and explores. And it does that in different ways than other genres. 
It doesn't do the same thing as electronic literature. It doesn't do the same thing as games. Even though there may be a relationship, and I think there certainly is a relationship, between all of these different digital genres. So I hope you're able to find some things that are interesting, provocative, and some things that are useful explorations of digital media and digital culture by looking at what digital art processes and digital art works are very broadly. Thanks for your studying and learning with me in this unit. I'll look forward to reading through your short essays, and I hope that you're able to continue your learning this semester and reach your own goals in learning about digital culture.